the H1B guy here, and today, the H1B guy critiques. Was the H1B IFR really a missed opportunity for beneficial reform? But before we get started, I'd like to ask you, if you haven't already, to please subscribe to the H1B Guy channel here on YouTube. It helps me to produce more content like this for you. I also wanted to mention that the H1B Guy offers a variety of consulting services. If I can help you with your case management, please reach out to me. In an article written by Sarah Pierce for the Migration Policy Institute titled Broad and Blunt, the Trump administration's H-1B changes missed the opportunity for real reform. The nonpartisan Migration Policy Institute seeks to improve immigration and integration policies through authoritative research and analysis opportunities for learning and dialogue and the development of new ideas to address complex policy questions. This was taken right from their mission statement on their website. The article starts with stating, quote, the Trump administration recently introduced the most significant changes to the H-1B visa program since it was last overhauled in 1990, promising to end the practice of replacing U.S. workers with highly skilled immigrants. As I've previously covered, the H-1B visa in its current form was created in 1990, and we have to go back to 2004 for the last time real changes to the H-1B visa program were signed into law. Back to the article, quote, while the problems the administration has identified and the interest in protecting U.S. workers are legitimate ones, its approach may cripple the H-1B program itself, which, regardless of its flaws, is the primary route through which employment-based immigrants enter the United States. I've been vocal about both points that Sarah makes here. We have to protect U.S. workers, and we cannot allow the H-1B visa or employment-based immigration to be completely eliminated. The effect of this restrictive policy will lead to more outsourcing of American jobs, and the U.S. will continue to lose the human capital war. That's a risk we simply cannot afford. Back to the article. Quote, undoubtedly, the dated H-1B visa program has long failed businesses and workers, U.S. and foreign-born alike. It's become increasingly dominated by IT companies that outsource their foreign workers to clients. This is the classic case of the book, Who Moved My Cheese, written by Stephen Johnson. There's no doubt the H-1B visa program has its flaws. But it has also led to significant technology advancement and innovation. Now, cue the third-party consulting companies that have been hotly debated and are at the forefront of the H-1B, uh, anti-H-1B sentiment. Back to the article, quote, Yet there are smart, implementable fixes that can be made to prevent such abuses and repoint the H-1B program in ways that would go much further toward advancing U.S. economic and competitiveness interests to the benefit of U.S. workers than the broad and blunt reforms advanced by the administration. Since the launch of this channel back at the end of June, I've been calling for H-1B reform. I'm talking about real reform that mutually benefits everyone, including the U.S. economy, employers, and high-skilled immigrants alike. The H-1B interim final rule that was announced 10 days ago is just not the comprehensive type of reform we need. Back to the article. At a time when businesses and U.S. workers are struggling to regain their footing during an unprecedented public health and economic crisis, disrupting the country's ability to tap into international talent as other countries intensify their searches for highly skilled could prove harmful for the U.S. economy. Again, please do not let the fact that we are currently in a human capital war be missed. Canada, Mexico, Australia, United Kingdom, Costa Rica, Philippines, China, India, and many others are flanking the U.S. on all sides. Back to the article, quote, President Donald Trump made the H-1B visa one of the themes of his 2016 campaign. Remember when we were promised a merit-based immigration system? 
Or what about the tweet from January 11, 2019, where President Trump stated, quote, H1-B holders in the United States can rest assured that changes are soon coming, which will bring both simplicity and certainty to your stay, including a potential path to citizenship. We want to encourage talented and highly skilled people to pursue career options in the U.S. That tweet seems like a footnote right now, just like the merit-based immigration system. Back to the article, quote, once in office, the president and his administration kept the issue of H-1B workers at contracted sites in mind, but rather than address the specific problem of the replacement of U.S. workers, the administration took a restrictive approach to the H-1B visas across the board, increasing scrutiny and more than doubling the application denial rates between 2016 and 2019. I can tell you firsthand that the heightened scrutiny on third-party worksite consultants' impact was immediately felt in 2017 after President Trump took office. Overnight, there were significant increases in requests for evidence, as well as higher approvals, which were coming in, um, percentages for the 12 and 24-month increments versus the typical 36-month increments. Back to the article, quote, failing to tailor its approach, the administration is also targeting contracting companies that supplement rather than replace staff at U.S. firms, including those too small to have their own full-time IT staff. This is exactly what I've been alluding, alluding to over the last few weeks. Yes, the new wage levels have an immediate impact on staffing firms, IT consulting, and integrators alike. But the more significant impact is on the smaller businesses and tech startups that rely on H-1B employees to run their day-to-day -day operations, who are now staring directly at a 30% salary increase for those employees. Back to the article, quote, leading up to the year 2000, there was a large demand for Y2K programs to ensure computer systems would smoothly roll over into the new millennium. These programs were labor and time intensive, meaning it made more sense for companies to outsource the work to outside vendors. This accelerated a larger IT industry trend towards a flexible project-based labor force, incentivizing employers to outsource their IT work and encouraging the pursuit of a cheaper and more adaptable labor force. This movement, however, ran counter to the structure of the H-1B program, which requires workers be hired as employees, not contractors. The limitation spurred the creation of companies formed for the primary purpose of recruiting and employing H-1B workers to be placed as project-based labor at client sites. Accessing this outside talent allows U.S. companies to tap IT expertise when needed for specific projects, and it's not always used to replace American workers. The ACWIA and the AC21 paved the way for the H-1B pipeline to fill the demand for the Y2K uh, program initiatives by significantly increasing the age cap lottery visas available from fiscal year 1999 through fiscal year 2003. Intentional or not, we can point back to the demand for contract-based human capital leading into Y2K and how a completely new industry was born. Back to the article, quote, as this cottage industry developed around the IT industry's needs, employment-based immigrant visa backlogs grew, ballooning the size of the temporary worker population over time. This has resulted in a growing population of H-1B workers who renew their visas far past the initially envisioned six-year limit. The H-1B visa was not designed to serve as a primary pathway to employment-based immigration, nor was it designed for such long-term use. While waiting for green cards that may never become available, visa holders find their right to stay in the country is tied to their sponsoring employer, incentivizing workers to endure wages and working conditions they might not otherwise accept. Let's not forget the H-1B visa is considered dual intent. 
Although the original intention was never for the H-1B visa to be extended indefinitely, it has become a byproduct of the 7% per country cap quota for employment-based permanent residency. Back to the article, quote, instead of addressing the clear need for deeper H-1B reform, U.S. economic dependence on this employment-based stream and the IT industry's reliance on a contract-based H-1B workforce, the administration has instead remained focused on bluntly eliminating all use of H-1B workers at client sites. Sure feels like the administration had been slowly heading towards this direction over the last four years. The pandemic simply gave them a reason to accelerate the policy. The H-1B IFR will only allow for 12 months extensions for H-1Bs being placed at third party in client work sites. Add that with the additional evidence required and we have what appears to be the beginning of the end of the third party consultant. Back to the article, quote, in 2018, did the administration begin collecting related data, including requiring employers to name any companies where the H-1B visa holder would perform work on contract? As a result, we now know that an average of 36% of H-1B workers approved in 2018 and 2019 were placed at client sites. I'm not surprised by this number at all. I would have guessed somewhere between one in four or one in three H-1B visa holders would be working at an in-client work site. As I've discussed at length, there are simply jobs that would go unfilled if it were not for the H-1B visa holder. I have personally witnessed this cycle for over 16 years. Back to the article, quote, yet more data and analysis are needed to understand the number of companies per year that host H-1B workers at their sites. The economic value of this workforce in practice and the frequency with which such foreign nationals are displacing U.S. workers. The findings today on the displacement of U.S. workers are almost entirely anecdotal. Have H-1Bs been replaced by U.S. workers? Yes, I can't say that that has never happened. But when we're referencing high-skilled niche technology roles, the odds of an H-1B replacing a U.S. worker are less than 1%. I made that number completely up, but that's just how I feel. It doesn't happen, or at least not in my professional experience. Back to the article, quote, while there is no doubt that broader reforms are needed to address the many mismatches between U.S. labor market needs and the H-1B program, the use of the U.S. temporary immigration system to patch badly needed reforms of the permanent employment-based system and the needs of American workers and businesses, cutting off the main driver of new employment-based immigration goes against long-term U.S. economic interests. It is in our best economic interest to continue to attract the best and brightest. Do we need reform around our current system? Yes, absolutely. It's outdated and it's archaic. I've stated that I'm okay with the H-1B IFR changes to the specialty occupation definition the 12 months extension for H-1Bs working at third-party and client work sites reeks of a money grab. But this has been going on for the better part of at least three years now and really isn't new. The real problem is with the new wage levels and how that impact will be felt from the smallest of IT shops all the way to the big tech companies that employ thousands of H-1B visa holders. I don't disagree with President Trump and his administration's stance on illegal immigration. I'm definitely not ready to build the wall yet either. But his actions surrounding legal employment-based immigration over the last 180 days has been something I just personally do not agree with. Here's hoping we see positive, mutual, beneficial reform in the future. For the full post, please check out the h1bguy.com. And if you haven't already, I'd like to ask you to please like this video, 
please subscribe to the H1B Guy channel here on YouTube and click the bell for notifications so that you're notified anytime a new post goes up here on this channel. If you've made it this far, I just want to say thank you for taking the time to watch my content. I really appreciate your support. The H1B Guy, your global source for all things H1B.